This afternoon, I participated in, in, in a session titled Unraveling Mass Incarceration Prospects and Obstacles. And let me just say, I had hoped that actually that I've, I've heard uh, Brian's uh, acceptance and I was hoping to use it as actually an introduction to, to, to my uh, uh, to, uh, to, to my speech, which is titled uh, Reducing Prison Populations by Reducing Life Sentences. So in, in, the, uh, in, in, in this presidential session this afternoon, uh, I, I'm, for those of you who um, presented, I'll be repeating um, uh, many of the themes discussed uh, uh, in, in that session. And for those of you who att attended, apologies uh, for the repetition. Uh, my aim is to keep my comments mercifully short because I know that I'm the only one keeping you from an enjoyable evening of food and drink. <laughs> so, uh, mass, mass incarceration is a blight on the United States justice system and detrimental to our social and political fabric. Much has been written on this topic, making the case very clearly of the harm caused by mass incarceration. So I am not here today to, to, <clears throat> to further make that case. Instead, I will use the privilege of my presidential address to describe the ways criminologists can contribute to making large reductions in unproductive and unjust uses of imprisonment. My conclusion is sober, but at the same time conditionally optimistic. There are, of course, daunting political obstacles that stand in the way of undoing the uses of imprisonment that serve no meaningful social purpose. However, with many small steps and persistent, I'm confident this goal can be achieved. State and federal uh, prison populations peaked about a decade ago. In 2010, the incarcerated populations uh, stood at about 1.6 million. And in the ensuing de a decade, there's been a welcome, though still modest, decline of 12%. I call this decline modest because on a per capita basis, uh, state and federal prison populations remain more than four times higher than they were 50 years ago. Beginning in 1972, we saw a span of nearly four decades in which the overall state and federal imprisonment rate increased every single year without exception. It, it was this sea swell that has made the United States the most heavily incarcerated country in the world, pro rata. If we look at state prisons, the decline thus far has been accomplished by reducing populations sentenced for property and drug offenses. In 2009, 19.3% of prisoners were incarcerated for property offenses. By 2019, that percentage had declined to 16%. For drug crimes, the decline was more pronounced, 18.7% uh, in 2009, down to 14.1% in 2019. The decline in the proportion of property and drug offenders in state prisons is not a recent phenomenon. Uh, this is a trend that begins more than 30 years ago. In 1990, uh, which is also the outset of the three-decade-long decline in crime, the percentage of state prisoners incarcerated for these offenses was still higher, 25.3%, and for, for property crimes, and 21.7% for drug offenses. The decline in the proportion of drug and property offenders in state prison has resulted in an increase in the proportion of prisoners incarcerated for violent offenses. In 1990, 45% uh, of state prisoners were convicted of violent offenses. By, by 2019, uh, that percentage had grown to 55%. I mentioned the, the growing representation of prisoners convicted of violent crimes, not to focus on the nature of specific crimes, but rather to direct our attention to the growing proportion of lifers in state prisons. Material reductions in prison populations will require major reforms in unproductive and unjust statutes regulating state and federal, um, regulating the use and definition of life sentences. These reforms will be politically very controversial and not easily achieved. The prisoners serving life sentences were mostly, uh, uh, who are, 
uh, were mostly but not entirely sentenced for violent crimes. And nearly all are incarcerated in state prisons. In 1984, the number of life, <coughs> excuse me, the number of lifers totaled 34,000, or 4.8 percent of the total state uh, prison population across all 50 states. By 2010, their numbers had, swol had swollen by nearly a, nearly a factor of five to 161,000, or 12.9 percent of state prison populations. If we add to, to the numbers of prisoners, add to that the numbers of people who are virtually lifers, that is to say individuals with sentences of 50,000, 50 years or more, the total population surges to over 200,000. An astonishing 6.2% of state prison populations in 2020. Even as the total prison population has modestly declined in two th since 2008, the number of lifers has increased during that period by 13 percent. This is a very serious problem. Imprisonment serves two distinct uh, purposes, crime prevention as well as meeting out of a just consequence for wrongdoing. In the context of life sentences, I want to address uh, uh, these two purposes in turn. From a crime prevention perspective, life sentences simply do, do not work. I've spent a good part of my uh, career studying the deterrent effect of sanctions and have found that increases in already long prison sentences have no material deterrent effect on crime. Ashley Nellis of the Sentencing Project, for example, recommends that life sentences be abolished and replaced with a 20-year sentence. The research evidence tells us that this reduction in sentence will not materially affect deterrence. I will, I will note that incarceration may serve to prevent crime by incapacitation, and probably does, but only during the time when the person is likely to commit crimes. Here, decades of criminological research demonstrates that crime is a young person's game, usually a young man's game, in fact. Geriatric prisoners are not a threat to public safety, and research shows that recidivism, recidivism declines with age. The slow accumulation of life, lifers in U.S. prison is turning our prisons into old age homes. Between 1993 and, and 2016, the percentage of prisoners age 50 or older has quadrupled from 5% to more than 20%, and that for prisoners 40 years or older, the percentage has more than doubled. The bottom line is that life sentences make no sense from a crime control perspective. Many lifers have committed uh, terrible crimes, but for, but for most, staying in prison until their death is, 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 but is staying in prison until their death a just dessert for their crime, uh, even by the harshest justifiable standards? I think not. First of all, 50% of lifers have been 57% of lifers have been convicted of murder, meaning that 43% were convicted uh, for something other than murder, and 8% were not even convicted of a violent crime at all. Even among those convicted of murder, there are degrees of culpability. To give an example from my own home state of Pennsylvania, accomplices to a crime in which a victim is murdered by another perpetrator, a so-called felony murder, receive mandatory life sentences. And as an example, Francisco Majuca was an accomplice in an apartment bur burglary in which his brother killed the apartment occupant. Francisco was convicted of felony murder and received a mandatory life sentence, where his brother, who actually pulled the trigger, was convicted of third degree homicide and received a sentence of 12 to 24 years. Their respective sentence violates any plausible, <coughs> plausible conception of proportionality of punishment. And that's just one example. I now turn to the way forward. These matters I've discussed, unraveling the overuse of life sentences or even abolishing life imprisonment entirely, they face daunting political challenges. There is, however, hope. Um, Nellis, in her most recent writings on this subject, reports that across all states, lifers as a percentage of the state's prison population averages 
There is, however, very large variation, with North Dakota being the lowest at 5%, and at the top of the list is Utah with 35%. You might ask, why can't more states then be like North Dakota? I don't have a good answer to this question, but unlike many other uh, issues, partisan politics does not seem to be the cause. Both Utah and North Dakota are solidly Republican. Um, in bright blue Democratic Massachusetts, 28% of the prison population are life lifers, while as in deep red Republican Idaho, the proportion is only 7%. So um, if rank order part partnership, partisanship is not a barrier to unwinding the overuse of, uh, of life imprisonment, what should the plans, the, the plans for realizing this, what should be the plans for realizing this goal? In reality, uh, there must be 51 such plans, one for each of the 50 states plus the federal government. Any plan must be grounded in, in a realistic assessment of the political climate of each state. Specifically, each state's political appetite for prison reform as it relates to lifers. In Pennsylvania, I know that there is little appetite for such reform, uh, which I know from several well-placed observers and participants of, America, of Pennsylvania politics. I expect uh, in other states the situation uh, is not much different. Based on this sobering reality, a plan must be long range and begin with small first steps that don't overshoot the bounds of political feasibility. For Pennsylvania, that means gaining sufficient support across party lines to win a majority vote of 102 in Pennsylvania's House and 26 in Pennsylvania's Senate, and then to secure the governor's signature. My short-term legislative priorities for Pennsylvania involve the mandatory life sentence for felony murder as well as parole board reform. It is not politically realistic at present to repeal the mandatory life sentence for felony mur murder, but a more modest uh, step could gain political traction, such as giving, giving judges and juries uh, the ability to consider the evidence and then decide on an appropriate punishment for felony murder, as they do for every other crime. The second step would be equally modest, but would have benefits. Returning to parole boards the ability to consider whether those sentenced to life imprisonment should ever be released, and if so, in, on what terms. Without these two very modest changes, the only avenues for release of lifers remains either exoneration or, or commutation by the governor upon unanimous recommendation of the Board of Pardons or the prisoner's death in prison. Over the longer term, I'd like to see a sharp curtailment of Pennsylvania's use of life without the possibility of parole, what we call LWOP. For, for decades, Pennsylvania has been among the states most heavily, making most heavy use of LWOP, both pro rata and in absolute numbers. While Pennsylvania's total prison population, like many other states, has been declining in recent years, the LWAP population continues to grow. Presently, more than 11% of Pennsylvania's prison population is serving an LWAP sentence, and more than one in five, that is, close to 1,200 people, were sentenced to life without parole for second-degree mur murder, a punishment disproportionate to, to the crime, in my view. As criminologists, then, how can we steer the course towards unjust, reducing unjust and ineffective uses of, of, of imprisonment, life imprisonment? One person I, important lesson I learned from my days serving in the administration of the late Pennsylvania Governor Dick Thornburg is that we all have a, have a role, a part to play in the policy process, and that change is almost always incremental as frustrating as that may be. For criminology to thrive as a discipline with relevance to the real world, I think it important that criminologists become more active in speaking out and writing on policy issues.
Over the years, I've seen my part in this, in this work as suggesting policies that may have more immediate political feasibility. Others have more long-run objectives uh, of, of radically overhauling sentencing practice in the, United, in the United States, even as their proposals face an uphill climb of gaining immediate political traction. I place the crucial work of Ashley Nellis and Mark Maurer in this category. Likewise, um, Mike Connery, whom I greatly admire and whose work has greatly influenced my own, has been for decades toiling away at, at the task of radical reform of criminal justice processes in the U.S. and elsewhere. Radical reform takes time and comes in small steps. Criminologists can and should play an important role in this process, and I implore all criminologists, criminologists to more actively engage the policy process. It is we who see the, the data, connect the dots, chart the trends, and create the picture, and it is that vision that allows governors, legislators, and opinion leaders to change the direction of societies. We need that vision today as we have inherited a terrible legacy of mass incarceration, but we must play our, our part in dismantling it. Thank you.